Welcome and thank you for joining us for the fourth lecture in a series of lectures on the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States, hosted by Princeton University's Keller Center. I'm excited to tell you about this series and to introduce you to our fabulous speaker today, Dr. Butler. My name is Derek Lido. I'm the chair of the entrepreneurship faculty here at Princeton and at the Keller Center. The center's mission is to arm our community with the intellectual foundation, innovation skills, and networks to propel, propel positive and sustainable societal impact. As a center, we recognize the pervasive and systemic racial inequity in our country and how this is deeply linked to so many of our country's most profound challenges. We understand how important it is that our community has an understanding of these systemic inequities as they work on solving some of humanity's most pressing challenges. Which brings me to this series of lectures. For all it, those interested in innovation and entrepreneurship, much can be learned from the entrepreneurs who have succeeded under some of the most daunting constraints. At the end of the day, isn't that what entrepreneurship is all about? Assembling limited resources for impact, Black innovators and entrepreneurs have overcome restrictive markets, segregation, Jim Crow laws, lack of access to capital, and threats of violence and death, theft of intellectual cap capital, and many other extreme challenges. And still they thrived. These entrepreneurs have created innovations which have resulted in lasting societal and cultural changes far beyond the Black community as well as in the communi that community itself. By exploring the history of Black entrepreneurship and innovation, we want to learn from the creative strategies Black entrepreneurs employed to succeed. At the same time, we want to explore how the constraints on Black entrepreneurship and business development have limited overall economics of not only Black communities, but our society as a whole, and how so many of these constraints, which have become institutionalized, can be overcome in the future. This exciting series of talks brings together scholars and academics from numerous institutions around the country to share out their scholarship in a discussion-based forum. And today, I'm particularly delighted to introduce you to Dr. John Sibley Butler. Using historical and president and present data. His presentation examines the contribution of Black entrepreneurship to the continuous rebirth of peoples of being and shopkeepers and others, in other words, the Black bourgeoisie. Forgotten data from the works such as from W.E.B. Du Bois' 1896 study of economic cooperation among Negro Americans in his 1911 book, The College Bred Negro, shows us that by the 1940s, Black families in this tradition were in their third generation of college matriculation. Evidence from Monroe Works research on the Negro Business League shows how by 1911, Blacks were just as likely to be self-employed as most Americans. Dr. John Butler will discuss his own work, Entrepreneurship and Self-Help Among Black Americans, A Reconsideration of Race and Economics, to compare Black Americans with other self-help entrepreneurial groups, which adopted the entrepreneurial model for, for adjustment to American society. This tradition continues to, to this day in the form of a value system which is grounded in Black success and shows how homophilia continues to full, fuel the Black bourgeoisie through organizations and endowments. The data explored from the 1700s to the present allows for the understanding and presentation of models which account for the continued success of Black Americans in this tradition. We will all learn how this model can fuel a rebirth among communities who have been lost in the wilderness. John Sibley Butler holds the J. Marion West Chair for Constructive Capitalism in the Graduate School of Business Department of Management at the University of Texas at Austin. He is a professor in the Management Department and holds a joint appointment in the Organizational Behavior in the College of Liberal Arts, where he holds the Daryl K. Royal Regents Professorship in Ethics and American Society. His research is in the areas of organizational behavior and entrepreneurship and new ventures. His research appears in professional journals and books. 
He is the Sam Barshop Fellow at the IC Squared Institute, an organization dedicated to the creation of new ventures throughout the world. Professor Butler has been involved as founder of Glowfish Nuclean. For the past seven years, Professor Butler has occupied the Distinguished Visiting Professor position at Aoyama Gaikin University in Tokyo, Japan, where he lectured on new venture startups and general entrepreneurship. And this past year, he was named as Distinguished Libra Professor at the University of Southern Maine. Professor Butler has served as a consultant for many firms in the US military. He has been management consultant for state farm insurance companies. And in this connection, he's given lectures on general management issues of corporate America. He's also one of the distinguished professors who composed the economic advisory team of Governor George Bush's 2000 presidential campaign. Professor Butler has appeared on over 30 radio and television programs, including the CBS Nightly News, the Jim Lehrer News Hour, the CBS Radio, the Osgood Report, and Public Radio. In addition, Professor Butler's research has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Time Magazine, and other newspapers and magazines across America. His books include Entrepreneurship and Health, Self-Help Among Black America, A Reconsideration of Race and Economics, and all that could be Black leadership and racial integration, the Army Way with Charles Moskos, which won the Washington Monthly Best Book Award. And he has two books in the works, Immigrant and Minority Entrepreneurship, The Continuous Rebirth of American Communities with George Kosmetsky, and Forgotten Citations, Studies in Community Entrepreneurship and Self-Help Among Black Americans with Patricia Green and Margaret Johnson. Professor Butler received his undergraduate education at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge and his PhD from Northwestern University. And so now without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Butler. Thank you very much, Derek. What a pleasure it is to, to be here to talk to you about some of my research strain. And it comes in an interesting time in my life as, as people show an interest in in black entrepreneurship. And the name of the, the piece is uh, Standing on Shoulders, uh, the contribution of black entrepreneurship to the continuous rebirth of the black bourgeoisie data through time and space. I guess I really got interested in this topic when I was at, uh, at Northwestern University and looking at the relationship between immigration, how people start in America and where they end up. So Gina, thank you very much for the next slide. So, you know, as a traditional professor, I like to start with theory. And I think this theory guides uh, what we're gonna talk about. And it's the whole idea that there is a relationship between future generations and how you develop yourself or come to a country. And I'm gonna start with, uh, Max Weber's excellent book, uh, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. I could also then utilize uh, Zimmer's work on the strangers and also birth of the multinational. What we're gonna talk about here on standing on shoulders is how we can have an algorithm, if you will, a historical algorithm and predict where people in the, based on how they integrated into modern capitalist kind of society. Of course, the spirit of capitalism, Weber was concerned with the relationship between Catholics and Protestants. And he wrote the book because he asked an interesting question. He said, throughout history, that is going back to Zimmer's work, throughout millennia, going back to the birth of the multinational, people who were excluded from society people who had no opportunity to serve the state turned significantly to the market for, so that they could benefit themselves and have a living. But he asked a question, he said, I don't understand why Catholics have not done the same thing. He talked about the Jewish population in Europe. He talked about the Huguenot, Huguenots in France. And indeed he could have talked about those people who came to America as quote, oppressed people. 
So what the spirit of capitalism predicted and what the birth of the multinationalist tells us that from a theoretical perspective, you should be able to, to go back and see how people adopted in certain kind of situations and where they ended up. So let me start by saying that uh, the Protestant ethic then is our baseline theoretical idea for thinking about something. And let me give you an interesting problem now. It's a problem in history and it's a problem in prediction. What if I tell you that if I looked at the development of America, I could tell you where you are today based on what your grandparents, great grandparents, great, great grandparents and great, 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 great grandparents did. In order to do that, what we do is we divide the country, right? Into what we call modes of adjustments. And if you look at how America developed those modes of adjustments, there are two basic kinds of modes. Some people came to America and joined the labor force and created some of the best jobs in the Western world through labor. Some groups came to America as entrepreneurs. They never worked in the great labor force, but they created what sociologists call urban enclaves that were composed of both business enterprise and also communities. If you look at the black population, of course, there was a free black population that was certainly in the tradition of the spirit of capitalism and Weber's tradition. And when I say they were in that tradition, if you go back and look at Blacks in New York at this time period, they were on Wall Street because they were developing private schools, they were developing private kinds of organizations. And as a result of that, they had a different kind of outcome than those just who went to the labor force. So to codify this, I'm just gonna say this. I can take the following case studies. I can look at the Japanese on the West Coast in America. I can look at black Americans in the South coming out of slavery. I can look at Eastern European Jews on the East Coast and I can bring it up and, 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 and look at the Chinese in America. What do they all have in common? They all have in common a tradition of intergenerational mobility based on self-employment and not labor. If we bring it down to the black population, it will look like this. You take the analog of Weber's Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, and you select if from the population, their parents, great-grandparents, or great-great-grandparents were self-employed entrepreneurs. If they were self-employed and entrepreneur, they have a whole nother kind of history and success that Blacks who went to the labor market had. So I can tell you then that if I look at the European po population, or if I look at Japanese on the West Coast, the outcomes for future generations are the same. So this is why my talk is based on standing on shoulders. It is based on the idea that there's nothing wrong with different modes of adaptation. But innovation and entrepreneurship is a tool. It is a tool for future generations and in a sense, this is sort of an autobiography because my, I'm a fourth generation college graduate, born in Southern in New Orleans, Louisiana, raised on the North shore of New Orleans, Louisiana, grew up with nothing but colleges and universities. Every butler in my family have finished college since 1900. But it has a strong emphasis on innovation and entrepreneurship. So what I decided to do was to trace what we call the well-established Black Americans from the 1700s, and we call it standing on shoulders. So if you look at all of the other groups that I talked about, whether it was 
you get the same effect with the Japanese Americans on the West Coast, a group that was put in concentration camps during World War II, but came out in a very, very entrepreneurial manner and outperformed everybody educational, right? I maintain that the most continuous educated group in America, with perhaps the Protestant group in the Northeast, is the old Southern Black bourgeoisie group, right? We have sent their kids to college for generations and switched different colleges as, as they grew up. So the big emphasis there, what entrepreneurship does is a tool. It provides the infrastructure in the face of hostility for people to do extremely well. Next slide, Jenny. So I think what I've done to, 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 to talk about this stuff is to create some, some editorials in, in, in national papers. You know, I've got one entitled Black Americans, Algorithm of Entrepreneurship and Group Success. Well, what could it be? Well, you're standing on shoulders because you are standing on the organizations that the entrepreneurs developed. Okay? As we get through the, the presentations, we'll talk about communities. They might be dead and they might be gone. Well, these groups develop a logical way of living in a hostile society along with the institutions. Now we could talk about the religious white Mormons, the same process, the same kinds of outcomes. A group that was burned out from New York through Chicago and ended up in Salt Lake City created a university for future generations. And of course you got the same, and it was done by, by entrepreneurs, okay? And you can see the same thing developing in Philadelphia, right? When the, the AME church, African-American Episcopal church developed Wilberforce. And then from that and switching to black Americans, it's all kind of organizations. So when I study this population, the early entrepreneurship have left and then it's coming back now. But my, my God, the organizations are there. So if I look celebrating the black bourgeoisie, I take the civil rights movement through, I think it's the, it's the bourgeois organization. People who had joined those organizations, my, Martin King was a third generation Morehouse graduate, a college uh, that was that was started by that tradition that's that's still around today doing great things third generation Morehouse person Rabinette and he was he was an AFIA he was in the Boule two booths for organizations Rab Abinath in it was also a member of Cap Alpha Psi uh, from, from one of those schools it goes on and on and on and if you look at the interrelations between what that entrepreneurship left in the early days then you begin to see people reaching back and asking a question. Of all the successful quote unquote blacks today, uh, next slide please Jenna, where did they come from? Now I have chosen books that's in this tradition. This is Margot Jefferson's book. And it's interesting because it's a Northern analysis, okay? You know, within the context of the black bourgeoisie, it has some Northern roots, but for the most part, it is Southern in terms of colleges, universities, expectations, intergenerational success, right? Which goes back to different kinds of organizations. So this is a recent book and she asked a question. She said, why can't, why couldn't the entire black population be in this tradition? She grew up in Negro land in Chicago but what does that mean growing up in Negro land in the context of innovation and entrepreneurship? What does it mean? Well, if you can picture with me the development of America when we study entrepreneurship and how it developed. In cities, there was a little German town, right? In cities, right, there was little, the little ethnic neighborhoods, that was Italian, little Italian town, right? German town, 
Italian town because as the immigrants came, some went to labor and start, some created innovations around organizations. Well, her point is she wears it on her sleeve. She grew up in that tradition. Her parents were, were doctors. Her grandparents were professionals. So it was nothing for her to really, really live well in America. As a matter of fact, one of the interesting things about this tradition, our next slide, is that they tend to look back and ask a question. What happened to the, to the infrastructure of ideas of success and how were they basically renegotiated? Well, let me see if I can answer that question. How did the literature switch from what Black Americans actually did in terms of community building and in terms of innovation, in terms of education, or what happened? How did it become associated with Northern ghettos, Northern cities, and a, a place like, I don't know, Milwaukee, the South Side of Chicago, or Philadelphia? Well, you know, you go back and you look at the literature and in about 1910, uh, Du Bois wrote a book called The Philadelphia Negro. And he talked about all the problems associated with that community. In 1911, Booker D. Washington wrote a, a piece on Durham, North Carolina, the city of the black middle class, which was all about develop, developing colleges and universities, developing the North Carolina Mutual, which became a huge, huge insurance companies creating whole tradition of education. By the way, when they desegregated Durham, the black high school made the argument that their kids were better educated than the white high school kid from the white high school. So why should they desegregate? So you, so, so you pick up this, this, this big tradition, if you will, about how it changed. Well, you know, when you begin to look at how and why things changed, then you begin to say the country itself switched from this tradition of entrepreneurship, right? To another tradition of what black Americans could not do. And therefore the entire analysis switched to that population that went to cities to create opportunities for themselves, which was the best jobs in the Western world. But this is what the data tells us among our groups. Factory workers are less likely to educate their kids. So if I'm growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, as my wife did in Glenville High School, and I can finish high school and join a union and make 30 bucks an hour, then why should I go to college? On the other hand, if I'm the child of a merchant, they're more likely to send their kids to college because they have the means to do so. And they also want their kids to go to college and learn about society and other kinds of things, okay? So then you, what, what you get there, this is a book on Black Georgetown Remembered, which one of those traditional kind of enclaves, Black enclaves, prior to the Kennedys discovering it, right, in the 1960s. I can remember going with my mother with one of her sorority sisters, and the, the city was all Black. I go back now, of course, the, the people have leased out their homes, and the churches, however, are still black. So you're getting within this tradition is, what is this stuff about entrepreneurship? What does it do? What does it release? The next slide, please, on the original black elite. And, and, and what I like to say is that it is all codified in books that people don't pay attention to, okay? So let's go over, if you will, the elements and the value structure that's created by self-employment, okay? In this case, by Black self-employment, but as I said, my book on entrepreneurship is very, very comparative. It, it compares many groups, Caucasian groups, in this same tradition. Now, here are the value structures that comes out of those kind of traditions. And I'll speak from the Black bourgeois tradition, but it's, it's in other traditions, okay? 
first of all, there's a sense in this education and organization, uh, and I think fraternal uh, driven. Okay. Uh, so when, when, the, when the vice president now, I'm a member of AKA, I have two sisters who are AKAs, and, and my, uh, my mother is a, is a Zeta, and my brother, like me, in Indiana, he went to IU, he was a Kappa. When it's driven by that, and you grow up with the sense that you might be a bit better than the larger society, okay? And you're living in a situation, right, that was based on entrepreneurship. And the big question is, how do you deal with people calling you an elite, an, an elite? So let me go back to some interesting scientific literature that I found very interesting. So I'm watching the nightly news about 10 years ago, and they're talking about black kids who don't want to go to college and have no tradition of going to college and calling other black kids white if they went to college, which most whites don't go to college, which I never understood. One thing about this tradition is we learn to distinguish between which types of whites you, you be around. That's just, a, that's just the truth, right? The question was, well, how could that be when the black population, right, is some of the best educated people in America intergenerationally? As Derek said in the introduction, the 1947 book, uh, Charles Johnson, the Negro College Graduate, these people were in their third and fourth generation of college graduation by 1947. So that first tradition that you, you get out of the self-employment rate, it's an old idea of what we call self-help. So when I was doing my research, I went to Durham, North Carolina, and they had a, a Negro business and professional league that's been there since the 1800s. And they also survived that enclave, which was a great enclave, which we were talking about. It also survived. And I asked the question, what's the history? So look, when we talk about problems, we never mention white America. OK, it is on us to solve. We have our big parties. We have our ball. We have, you know, we have the, you know, another thing is, you know, there are black country clubs all over the South in this tradition. Mine was Pontchartrain Park in New Orleans. I turn on the television, they're talking about Tiger Woods being the first, bless his heart, and his accident being the first. They're the black PGA, right? I turn on the TV and I hear, well, you know, this person is the first black coach that coached here while I went to LSU. I can tell you this, LSU couldn't stay on the same field with Southern University when I was in high school. And by the way, University of Texas could not have beaten Prairie View when I was in high school. Right? So you grow up with this whole idea of history. Next slide, please and people doing things. So, 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 this, so this is a book uh, called Our Kind of People. Now these are recent books, right? These are recent books that try to grapple with the fact that you're standing on the shoulders of merchants, right? It's actually merchants who actually created these kinds of tradition. And as Juliet Walker would do when she, pre when she presents, and I have in my book, we can go through all ki the kinds of enterprises. I mean, what kind of enterprises did they have? Well, they were community-based. You went to Sears and Roebuck to buy big stuff, but they were coffee shops, they were cleaners, they were servers, there was all kinds of uh, electrical appliance uh, stores where you actually bought in the community. But this is before the big, the big change uh, came about. So what Lawrence, who just died, uh, Memo de Boulay, tried to do was capture the historical tradition of our kind of people. Okay. And it is a homophily. You know, and the question is, would it have happened if there was no segregation? Because okay. if, if you look at the white population, you certainly find uh, deviations in different traditions in terms of education. I think the white Mormons have a great tradition of education. My white Mormon friends would try to make it to BYU. Uh, my my uh, people in, in my group, in that tradition, the bourgeois group, uh, they would turn down great universities, right? To go to a, a Dillard or a Xavier or Morehouse or Spelman. I went to LSU, but my father demanded my sister go to Dillard University, which is a private school uh, in New Orleans or Xavier. So he tries to capture all of these things. Now, what's happening? What's, next slide, slide, please. 
with what's happening among <coughs> Black Americans in general, in terms of not less than less than a third of the Black population is in is in uh, is in poverty. But what's happening? What are people documenting? Well, people are, are documenting a solution, are looking for the solution that's already there. So this is T. M. Pryor, another guy. So he, I think he might have been Moore's roommate at Morehouse, and he wrote a book called Wealth Building: Lessons of Booker T. Washington for a New Black America. And he poses an interesting question and an interesting answer. The answer to everything that you've been talking about, that you're searching for, is already here. But you have to glorify market economies. You have to learn to take your problems right to the market. And the person who did that better, other than the free blacks prior to the Civil War, was Booker T. Washington, an ex-slave, be at Tuskegee University, the first building, the first business school that was very, very effective in the South. He hired scientists, and he, along with the scientists, created a whole industry on technology transfer. And so he lays out the relationship of what needs to be done and how would you solve it today. So let's say that we're consulting and we have an, and let's go to Chicago since it's always in the news. The south side of Chicago, or we could, or we could go to Milwaukee, or we could go to, to, to any city that's having problems. Booker well, Washington said, well, you buy the city. You're making an enclave. You buy and you purchase, you create shops. And if there's a problem in Cleveland, Ohio, all of the empty buildings, they become a private university. And then you go about creating the value structure of the relationship between innovation and entrepreneurship because it takes us back to Max Weber. That is, if you are in a place where, where there is an oppression going on, you take your problem to the market. It is a waste of time to stop to worry about who likes you, who's racist, because you don't have time, you have to take care of yourself. Of course, he, TM thinks that Martin, his, his fraternity brother, and really threw the black population offline by not having an economic component of Booker T. Washington's wealth development. Now, remember, if you look at what Weber said, and if you look at the history, it's going to be institutions built, right? You're going to create institutions. So our group in Southern Luke, I'm guessing 40% of the Black population with the private schools. Remember that Morehouse is private, Spelman is private, Hampton is private, Dillard is private, Xavier is private, Tougaloo, Tougaloo is private, Houston Tillerson is private. And they all have done great things. And of course, they all have an association traditionally with, with the Ivy League also, okay? So, so you look at all of this stuff and then you ask another question. Mm. What does it mean for wealth building? Now remember, the wealth building is about not being a part of the working class. Now, I don't think you could avoid being a part of the working class because I think all work is honorable. They just have different kinds of outcomes. I mean, if you own a small shop, you're more likely to be able to send your kids to college in the 1920s and the 1930s. There, were, there was no help unless you were, if you, unless you went to the military with the GI Bill. There were no scholarships unless you, of course, um, uh, played sports at, at some school. That was no help. So the web building, what he does is to go through all of the lessons of entrepreneurship. All, right? all of the lessons that you will find, next slide, in, in my colleague's book, great book, by the history of black business in America. What a great book. Why is this book so great? Because you can trace 
economic secure black enclaves and connect them to the enterprises that they did, okay? So we can go back to Chicago, right? When, when Chicago was booming in a great city, right? And, and they had a, they have written books about how Ebony came out of there, right? How Jet uh, uh, came out of there and how Proline uh, came out of there. Uh, Eric is, uh, is my dear friend, he lives in, um, in Florida now and his parents founded uh, you know, all of the Johnson uh, products. And I didn't know that they owned Soul Train. I was shocked when he told me that they owned Soul Train. So therefore, when the bourgeois tradition leaves, everything will deteriorate. That is, you cannot depend on people bailing you out, right? Now, you have a lot of people who would say, well, what can we do for you? But then do anything for the community. So T.M. Pryor's book said, well, you buy the community and you make it an entrepreneur kind of enclave. I think Atlanta, Georgia is kind of close to that. When I fly into Atlanta, I land, I, you know, I land in Atlanta. It's like landing in Chinatown if you're, if you're Chinese and all the pictures are in the airport are black and the whole tradition is black. They've got you know, all of that black tradition and, and everybody is, is encouraged to go to a, a Morehouse or Spelman, have a long, long tradition. And so it becomes very, very interesting to understand what Juliet Walker said in the history, because she takes us to the actual entrepreneurs. And I just want to showcase some and then bring it to, to my work. Next, next, next slide, please. This is, this is Jake Simmons, um, who was an oil man that nobody knows about in Texas became, of course, a multi-multi-millionaire, um, looking at going through all of the host hostility. Uh, uh, Jake Simmons Jr., in the making of an African-American or a dynasty. Nobody would know about this person, right? But he is the reason why, and the support of black colleges, right, in Oklahoma. He supported black colleges, right, in East Texas. Of course, he educated all of his children. So we have lost those lessons and they have been replaced by other heroes. Now in this tradition, the heroes are the entrepreneurs. They're not the politicians. They're not the religious leaders. They are the entrepreneurs. Something that we did in Texas too, related to that. I was director of IC Square, which is much like your Keller Center. We ran the uh, Austin Technology Incubator. From that incubator came Dell Computers with Dale Michael Dell and Jim Trussard and National Instruments and John Mackey and, uh, and Whole Foods, who was a philosophy major, major. And Herb Kelleher was hanging around San Antonio and coming up when he was doing uh, Southwest Airlines. Well, what we did in Texas it was, we made the entrepreneurs the heroes. This state is run by entrepreneurs. Oh, the governor would say this and the governor would say that, but this state that created four times the amount of jobs than anybody else, right, is run by entrepreneurs. And they asked me, what politically, what is it? Well, I think it's libertarian and they become Republican Democrat when it's convenient to do so. Because all the Democrats in, who were Republicans, I mean, who were Democrats, including the governor, he was a Democrat, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Well, if you look at the black bourgeoisie, all the heroes were business people. So what I tried to do in my book, next slide, please, Gina. What I tried to do in my book was to bring all of this together and to glorify the, the heroes, if you will, but more importantly, to do a comparative analysis. I think I do the Pakistanis. I think I do Eastern European Jews. I do the Japanese. I do Black Southern who come out educationally, basically the same, even in the face of hostility. Okay. Let me talk some about, about this book, which kind of codifies um, the data that I've talked about. First of all, it is all data-based. That is, you cannot go through 
and write a book like this without it being a database. When I wrote the book, I went to uh, the Center for National Naval Enterprise to meet with a columnist by the name of Bill Raspberry, who walked, who worked for the Washington Post who since deceased. And William Raspberry said to me, Butler, you better document everything because nobody will believe you because we don't talk about this in America. We don't talk about wealthy blacks in America and we don't talk about the black bourgeoisie in America. As a matter of fact, what we do is we beat up on the black bourgeoisie. Remember he said that E. Franklin Fraser wrote a book that, that damned the black bourgeoisie, but he could have been talking about any self-help group in America. So let me just talk about this and talk about the different traditions and, and talk about how they have changed. And then we're, we're getting into the overall uh, sociology of entrepreneurship. What the book does is to ask a different kind of question. And that question is, if you have been an oppressed group in America, why are you successful? How can you account for all of this success in America by Black Americans? How can you account for the fact that they had a different kind of path to where they are now? And can that path be developed? So what I do, I do a community base and I said, I'm gonna take the best, I'm gonna take the worst of communities. I had about a hundred plus communities to choose from. Now, let me take you to a place that you call segregation and my group called the glory years because they had black enterprises and you had to buy from black enterprises in the South, right? The communities were strong, right? The private education was strong. So it was an enclave. It was a monopoly. It's about people coming together and solving a problem. Okay, I said, okay, let's get away from the vapor, although it is my theory, and let's do some community. So I chose Durham, North Carolina between the 1870s and show how it became the center for entrepreneurship among Black Americans and how it created North Carolina College continued to thrive, educated its kids, sent its kids to colleges outside of the South if they chose. Now, my brother went to Indiana, but he was, he was kind of beat up for not going to, to, uh, to a Morehouse, uh, you know, or going to a Southern University, or going to a Grambling College, but he went outside to Indiana, Indiana University. And if you look at the research on Durham and Boogity Washington, wrote the first article in 1911. I stayed there for two months doing research and it really, really did help me that I was a member of Kappa Kappa Psi. I was in the Boule. I was in all, I had hit all of those organizations that they appreciated because they wouldn't talk to me at first until they found out my background. And then of course, all our parents knew each other. Our grandparents went to college with each other and et cetera, but that was Durham. Then I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, before it became popular. I wrote a chapter on Tulsa. Tulsa developed a Black Wall Street, same thing. Black enterprises everywhere, and it was massive. It was massive. It was so successful, you know, the Blacks in Tulsa got there on the Trail of Tears with, with Native Americans from Alabama, and they also deeded to them petroleum. So they had all base. Right? Well, the white population was kind of jealous of that all base. And you go back to all of the relationship between what happened to the Jewish Americans when they were in Europe. Well, then the jealousy kicked in and they were destroyed. So if you, if you, if you go back and, and, uh, and re read a book by some book called The Jews in Modern Capitalism, it is an answer to Max Weber's book, The Protestantic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Hitler burned this book, by the way. But what Sombart argued in Jews of Modern Capitalism was, hey, look, you want to talk religion? Well, let me tell you something. Protestantism is Judaism, right? And all of the, all of the uh, emphasis on market economy that you talk about that's attributed to Weber, right? Then we're going to attribute that to the Jewish population, not the Protestant population. Right, because they both come from the same basic place. Well, what happened 
And Tulsa was that it was destroyed. The whole community was destroyed in the early 1900s, but they built it back and it was much better. It was a Mecca. It had everything you thought you needed, but it was self-contained. That is, you did not venture outside of that, but that's Hamasli. And, and of course, within this Hamasli, it also developed that bourgeoisie out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, belonged to the same organizations, right, whether it's Jack and Jill. So people ask me, well, how do you, how do you pass that tradition? All of the kids belong to Jack and Jill. That's a black organization where it's all bourgeois and the kids are taught this history that I'm telling you now. The bad thing about it, it is so inclusive, it is exclusive. The bad thing about my group is if you're not a member of that group, you're not a member of that group. And it's hard to get in that group, but it can be cracked. So one of the things that people talk about today are Northern kids with no bourgeois tradition, right? Moving to Southern cities, right? With a value structure that's very, very different. And it's different in terms of education. For example, when I went to, to LSU in Baton Rouge, all the blacks there were second and third generation college graduates. When I went to Northwestern for graduate school, the undergraduates were talking about first generations because they came from factory, nothing wrong with coming factory. There were smaller numbers from that tradition, but for the most part, they were on Northwestern University for integrating and becoming first generations. In Southern Louisiana, Dillard University and Southern University were complaining that they were taking the best students uh, from them. So it was a different kind of dynamic. So it was rebuilt. And of course, all of these enclaves, again, if you look at all of the great enterprises that Juliet Walker talks about, but it's the value system that's carried on that's very, very interesting. So I think that it is city-based and entrepreneurship is a tool. It is a tool that would take future generations to places where they need to be despite the hostility used against them. I taught in Japan for 14, for 14 summers. It was a samurai in Japan. It is the exact same kind of tradition. If you exclude it, if you're Japanese, if you're Korean and you're Japan, you turn to entrepreneurship because there's no work for you in the great corporation if you're Korean and you live in, you happen to live in, in Japan. When I was there, my TA in the MBA program was Korean, Korean and she could not have the same kind of opportunities. So I would give talks to, to the entrepreneurs in, in Japan and their ethnic roots were Korean. So entrepreneurship, next slide. Let me just just, just uh, quickly, how much time do I have, uh, Derek? We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, we do have one question that came in too. So um, if we could just leave a, a couple minutes at the end there. Yeah, well, let me just talk about where all of this come from and uh, uh, very, very quickly where all of this come from. Uh, it is really called the sociology of entrepreneurship. Um, Alex Portes, Princeton professor has a great, great book. I mean, just a wonderful book on Latin journey, which is also in this tradition. When he looked at those Cubans who came and became very entrepreneurial versus those who did not and how they ended up in different kinds of places. And how Miami was a, de a decaying city. And when Castro said there will be a new Havana, he didn't know it was gonna be in Miami because the entrepreneurs left. When the entrepreneurs left, got on the boat and went to Miami, they brought the entrepreneurship spirit uh, uh, with them. So, so, so what it does, next slide please, very quickly. So what it does really, it, it throws you into some comparative research, right? And I just want you to, I'm gonna do a little theory, you know, I gotta leave you guys with some theory. And I think I wanna end, no, go back, yep. Yeah. There we go. I wanna end with, uh, I started with the mode of, of incorporation and I talked some about the stranger. Let's talk some about Milliman theory, collective theory and unclay theory. And then I'll talk about what black entrepreneurship is uh, today. You know, all of the stuff here, the unclay theory, 
it presupposed a community of togetherness. Okay. But as we all know, uh, technology has made communities go online and lots of things have changed. And so black entrepreneurship on the tech side is booming, right? But it's booming in a different way. It's not, nobody knows who you are on the collective side, right? But what's different is in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, the entire structure was built for black entrepreneurship, right? Where you had the Negro Business League, you had a business league in every city that was replaced by the NAACP that had no component of, of, of uh, economics related to it. So this enclave theory, this homophily, and of course, Blacks can live anywhere they want to now, okay? I, for example, I think I live in one of the wealthiest Black population cities in America, which is Austin, Texas. And not just because Robert Smith lives here, they have a history of the private school here was here before the University of Texas. As a matter of fact, the interesting case study it is it was the entrepreneurs from Houston Tillerson College, a private black school, who went to the legislature after the Civil War and said, we think that whites should have a school here. And that school became the University of Texas, which of course excluded them on the basis of race. But that their college and university was is 10 years older, that private black school, than the University of Texas, because after the Civil War, the Northern philanthropists came and created those whole series of private schools. So this is kind of where we are. The shoulders are still there. They tend to send themselves to certain kinds of schools. It's more of a, it's more of a homophily clan uh, than anything. But what's I think important is, is that it was the early entrepreneurs that Juliet Walker could talk about. And of course, we could talk about all of the hundreds of thousands of black entrepreneurs who created where they are today. And the question is, what would you do today? Or you put entrepreneurship at the center of community. Okay? Uh, what that means is then you praise the entrepreneurs, you create the structures for entrepreneurs, and there'll be all kinds of entrepreneurs. Okay. I mean, there'll be entrepreneurs in the communities. Uh, there will be a colleges, there will be a universities, they will support, okay? So I can take you to uh, any, I can take you to Jackson, Mississippi, where there's two little college here and there's Jackson State here. And they're standing on the shoulders of people because they haven't really did, done any more entrepreneurial kind of stuff. They're standing on the shoulders that people did years and years ago. Well, when we transfer this, to general America, Detroit is gone because the entrepreneurs are gone, right? Chicago is gone because the entrepreneurs are gone. You cannot have any kind of community, community without, without putting self-employment at the very, very center of things. So I contend, uh, as my good buddy who wrote the book on, um, on um, entrepreneurship from the University of Chicago in the bourgeois tradition, Bourgeois tradition just means shopkeepers. That all, that's all it means. It just means shopkeepers. It means, it means people who go and take their problems to the market. Now, I conclude by saying this. In a lot of ways, that shop tradition is designed to destroy itself. Because, I mean, I grew up when my, my parents were, were college educated with masters. And PhDs and stuff, but you know, we had we had model shops, and I would say that I wouldn't want to run here. I wouldn't stay here all my life and run this shop. So education takes the kids away from the base, and you can see this with with all immigrant Americans, right? That is, you can see this in in schools where the kids of the shopkeepers are the ones that's doing extremely well. I see it with my African students. All all of my African students at the undergraduate school, at the McCombs Business School, all of the black students are first generation from Nigeria. And they're Igbo from a certain kind of, from, from a certain kind of tradition. So, so here's the deal. The entrepreneurs will build the tradition. The kids go off to college and forget about the tradition. And then they're more likely to come back to it in the elderly years. And this is why you're standing on shoulders. So if you're black today, 
And if you've been doing extremely well and you go back through your history, and if your great, great, great grandparents finished college, that accounts for where you are today. You know, so you can look at the black population and you can ask a question that is using education as a variable. And most black college graduates today are third and fourth generation college graduates. They're not first and second college generation. The third and fourth college generation. Okay, I guess I should stop there and talking about the impact of entrepreneurship and the value structures to, to augment all of the great entrepreneurs that's been talked about. All right, ready for questions. Great, thanks. Um, we probably have time for maybe one or two. Uh, so I'm just gonna read this one directly. You mentioned that Martin King and other civil rights activists are products of the black bourgeoisie. Um, this person says they've read that the singer Lena Horne was also a product of this custom as she was the daughter of the prominent Calhoun family. Um, but Horne later rebelled against the tradition of her family in terms of philosophical and political views and values. So what was the discontent, discontent of the children of the black bourgeoisie who in their activists or artistic careers associated themselves with the black underclass? Well, it's the same thing that happened to the white hippies in the 1960s. You know, we know that the kids are, uh, that can be diametrically opposed to where they are. And, and, and also, that's very, very interesting because if you look at that, that's not, that's not unusual at all. Of course, what they call, and I just call it my tribe, is that they're lost, they're going to be lost in the general population. But it's not unusual at all for, for kids to, to, you know, if you look at what happened to the Hirsch family, if you look at what happened to uh, lots of families, right? then the bourgeois tradition can be essentially, um, you know, people can say, okay, I want out of that tradition. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, when my son, my son went to the University of Texas at Austin, you know, he interviews a black, a black college and they ask, okay, did your grandfather go here? Did your great grandfather go here? Was there a member of A5A? Was there, yeah, okay, well, you know, he didn't want to put up with that. So he went to the University of Texas. Uh, it, it, is, it is not unusual and we're not surprised and I think that what you do is you go into data. So that becomes another data set uh, to look at. But there, there's the black population who don't even know about this tradition. And there's the black population who hate this tradition because then they can't explain how they got there. I mean, they can't explain how, how Martin was a third generation college graduate. And he finished school, well, in 1950s. And then he got his PhD from Boston University. I mean, how could it be that he was black, right? And how could it be that uh, somebody could come out of slavery uh, like and start a Tuskegee that's still there. How could it be? Uh, you know, how could Hampton University start? Because they have no tradition of black self-help. Their only vision of black America is, okay, you know, we're gonna oppress people and that's bad and we're gonna protest and we're gonna march, nothing wrong with that, but there are different outcomes uh, for that. Good question. Next question. Okay. We unfortunately are at time, uh, Dr. Butler. We are at the end of the time for the talk. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Um, as we mentioned before, this is part of a larger series that the Keller Center is having on the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States. Um, so I'm going to drop that link in the chat right now to our webpage. Um, you'll see that there is one more event coming up for this semester, um, and Dr. Butler will actually be back for that on April 22nd. Um, we're bringing back all of the speakers that um, have been with us for the past couple months, and we'll, you know, talk to them of how all their research intersects with one another. Um, one other note is that a survey will pop up as soon as you exit the webinar today. We love any feedback that you have. Um, and we'd also like to invite you to the discussion portion of this event. Uh, a link just went to all of your emails that you received this link to. Um, it'll be in a different Zoom meeting and we can all meet there and just have an informal conversation um, talking about this topic further. So thank you so much, Dr. Butler. Um, and we hope to see you all at the discussion portion. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Learn more about the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States by visiting kellercenter.princeton.edu slash Black entrepreneurship. Join us for future Keller Center events, which you can find at kellercenter.princeton.edu slash events.